Um, well, welcome everybody. We've got a great crowd today. And so just as a brief introduction, IARPIC, um, if you're not familiar with, with IARPIC yet, it's the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. Um, it brings together leaders from agen agencies, departments, and offices across the U.S. federal government to enhance collaboration on research in the Arctic. Um, IARPIC Collaborations is the public branch of IARPIC and aims to facilitate the interagency communication, coordination, and collaboration to advance Arctic science. And IARPIC re released its Arctic Research Plan in 2022, so that's uh, last year. Uh, the Fiscal Oceanography Community of Practice is, is you, basically, a group of scientists and stakeholders from across the interagency spectrum um, with an interest in learning and communicating about federally funded research on the physical oceanography of the Arctic Ocean. Um, today we'll be talking about a new model observational synthesis activity that's uh, called the Consortium for the Advancement of Marine Arctic Science, or CAMAS. CAMAS aims to continue the legacy of international collaboration on marine Arctic science that was started in the 90s with activities like the Arctic Ocean Model into Comparison Project and the Forum for Arctic Model and Observational Synthesis. Um, the goal of CAMAS is to advance the understanding and model representation of critical marine Arctic processes that contribute to the rapid changes in the Arctic, um, and it plans to do that through the coordination of collaborative research projects uh, that confront models with observations. Um, we'll have three uh, presenters today. First, Mike Steele uh, will briefly um, give a review of the history of AOMIP and FAMAS. Um, Mike is in Bergen at the moment, so uh, he will not be able to join in person, um, but we will play a pre-recorded presentation. The next presentation will be given by Jackie Clement Kinney from the Naval Postgraduate School, and she will uh, introduce CAMAS to, to you, the community. And finally, uh, we'll conclude with a discussion led by Yashu Zhang um, about community needs and potential collaborative activities for CAMAS. So with that, I'll hand it over to um, Meredith to start uh, Mike's presentation. Okay, great. Bear with me while I um, get this presentation up. And I'm sorry, but I don't think, unless someone knows a way to get this to be in full screen. I think it just will be like this. Meredith, it looks like maybe in the bottom right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we'll we'll try this and if things are cut off or um, whatnot, then just let me know. University of Washington in Oops. Seattle. And I'm Hello there, this is Mike Steele from the University of Washington in Seattle. And I'm gonna be giving a short talk about uh, AOMIP and FAMIS, two acronyms I will explain later. I call myself the vice president because I was kind of second in charge during these uh, two uh, projects. So the leader, the president, of our enterprise was Andrei Prochetinsky, who was at UAF in Fairbanks and then moved to Woods Hole. So Andre is the reason that all of this existed. He came up with the idea in the first place. And his idea was called AOMIP at first, the Arctic Ocean Model Intercomparison Project, lasted a little over 10 years. The funding came from the National Science Foundation through um, UAF, Fairbanks, and IARC, and then after a few years, more directly from the National Science Foundation, the uh, ARCS, Arctic System Science Program. So in phase one, NSF gave us money for annual meetings and travel and stuff, and also some salary support for about half a dozen modelers to you know, run simulations and do some analysis. And after a few years of that, NSF decided that they just wanted to fund us for coordination activities. So, you know, meetings and travel. Here is a, um, a, a photo from um, an early meeting of AOMIP at 2004 at GFDL in Princeton. And what you can see is, uh, first of all, you know, it's just not a lot of um, scientists involved at the time and definitely 
not a lot of early career scientists. So this was uh, uh, basically all modelers, uh, fairly established in their careers, Arctic Ocean modelers. And what we did in those first years was do a lot of chatting, a lot of discussion of uh, how things were going with our modeling. You know, um, I'm having trouble with my uh, melt pond parameterization. What are you guys doing with that? Uh, we'd have talks, we'd have lots of discussion, honest discussion, warts and all kinds of discussions, um, and talk about the differences in our models, in the physics, in the numerics, and then of course, uh, the output and, and what we were getting and what are the differences and, and even the causes of those differences. So here's um, one of my favorite examples from those early years uh, about Atlantic water circulation in the Arctic Ocean. And what we found was that some models or model runs were getting cyclonic boundary, uh, boundary trapped, you know, Atlantic water circulation at depth running around the entire Arctic Ocean, the Eurasian Basin and the Amerasian Basin. However, other models were uh, wholly or partly, you know, in some parts of the Arctic, not other parts, and sometimes, but not other times, getting anticyclonic Atlantic water circulation. And the observations at that time, limited as they were, the geochemical tracers, the um, limited current meter database, indicated that probably cyclonic was the was the real the real answer there now what i want to stress is uh, two things the what and the why um, it was a huge major accomplishment to just create this aomip group so that we could get together and chat and figure out these differences because before aomip existed it really was difficult to do this kind of intercomparison and just discover what the differences were, you know? I mean, maybe you were getting some anticyclonic Atlantic water circulation, but you didn't pay that close attention to it. But if you had to present it in the context of what everybody else is doing, all of a sudden, yeah, you know, it's pretty obvious something is up there. So that was a huge, a huge thing just to be able to document what's going on What's, what, are, what are the commonalities and what are the differences in Arctic sea ice ocean modeling? But then of course, the next question is why? Why are there differences? And sometimes we were able to you know, find an answer to that kind of question. Other times, you know, it's just more difficult. In this case, we, we, we had success. You know, we found some answers. Um, and here, there were a, a several papers written about this subject by AOMIP researchers. Here I'm grabbing a figure from the paper that I wrote with Jinlin Zhang. And what we found was that we were getting uh, a weak or no Atlantic water cyclonic circulation, especially over in the Amerasian basin uh, in our standard run, which used regular mixing, all right? So there's the KPP mixing scheme and um, below the mixed layer in the interior ocean, there's this um, you know tuning parameter called background mixing that uh, attempts to capture internal wave breaking mixing and tidal mixing and all that stuff. And if you use, if we, if we used the, 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 um, the number for mixing that was used in the rest of the world ocean, we got this uh, you know, bad result. And if we turned it down by a factor of 10, reduced it by a factor of 10, then we got a nice cyclonic circulation in the Amerasian basin. And you know we shouldn't have been surprised by that. Every uh, the observationalists from way back when already knew that the the Arctic Ocean is a very quiet ocean, low mixing rates because of ice and surface stratification. But that message basically hadn't gotten to the modelers, and so you know in particular we we basically thought that the anticyclonic Beaufort Gyre wind force at the surface was extending too far down. In the in the in the regular mixing case and kind of um, sort of wiping out the cyclonic and Atlantic water circulation, and this was uh, supported by other papers, which also went into deep and wonderful analysis of the potential vorticity um, dynamics of Atlantic water uh, inflows and outflows and circulation. 
So uh, after uh, a, fir- a number of years in the late uh, 2000s, the first decade there of the century, uh, we realized that our the name of our project ended with model intercomparison project. So, you know, maybe we should do a MIP. And uh, so we outlined a coordinated activity where everyone was supposed to use the same atmospheric forcing on their ice ocean models. And um, maybe the same things like uh, surface restoring and, and rubber, river runoff and um, sea ice, albedo, things like that. All right, constraining the models. And you know, that's what a MIP is. What's a MIP? A MIP is a bunch of modelers getting together and running their models in a constrained way where everyone's supposed to do at least something the same, you know? So you're reducing the degrees of freedom, you're comparing apples and apples. So, you know, the same forcing, the same parameterizations, the same tuning constants. If not all of them, then, you know, some big subset of them. Unfortunately, when we did that, uh, we had a a big fail, all right? So what happened was that um, people, uh, found that in their simulations, the sea ice was like way too thick, like 20 meters thick, 50 meters thick, I don't know, or completely absent. And and there were other problems, but that was the main one. And the reason is because the sea ice mass balance is just extremely sensitive, all right? You uh, put in a couple of watts per meter squared, and all of a sudden, you've got no ice, or you turn it down, you've got like way too thick ice. Um and so, you know, when we, uh, so all the models had been tuned to whatever atmospheric forcing they used. Okay, we told them use this atmospheric forcing. And furthermore, you can't like retune your ice albedo or drag coefficients to that new atmospheric forcing. You got to use our drag coefficients at our albedo. And it just didn't work. And so, you know, this is, um, this could have been an opportunity, I suppose. You know, we could have learned something like uh, from these differences, but. Basically, we just had a rebellion on our hands. And um, so we had to rethink our strategy. And so what we did was we renamed the project FAMOUS, the Forum for Arctic Modeling and Observational Synthesis. We decided we're not a MIP anymore. We're a forum. You know, a forum is where people get together and and chat, you know, and and make progress that way. Uh, So in in FAMOUS, the, the M is models, mostly ice ocean with some having a BGC, a uh, biogeochemical uh, component, but uh, mostly not uh, a couple of climate models, though some. And then O for observations, you know, a, a much stronger um, inclusion of observationalists. Why? Well, for model forcing, validation, and assimilation. But, you know, that's kind of like uh, second-class citizens, really, you know. Uh, they also were, were very important there just for inspiration, you know. Observationalists are... Sh- are finding some really cool stuff, and um, maybe the modelers can try to reproduce or understand those those cool results from the observationalists. And maybe the observationalists are finding new uh, things uh, that the modelers can use for validation. You know, so there was a definitely a back and forth uh, conversation there that was very very valuable. So we get together annually and have a, a meeting with talks and breakout sessions and panel discussions. On Tuesday, the first day of the meeting, there would be a school for early career scientists, Wednesday through Friday, the regular workshop. This all looks fairly standard. We've all been to these kind of meetings slash, you know, workshops. And what do you do? You present your your latest results and you um, and you talk to some people and you go home and you you basically never think about that meeting again. You know, it was fun. And and that's the end of it. And famous was definitely not that. Famous was a very distinctive thing. Famous had an objective. Everybody there had to do something. And this is what you had to do. You had to get together in your breakout sessions or you know lunchtime or whatever it is and figure out a collaboration. That was your job. Everyone has a job at Famous. And that was to create some kind of, of, um, of a group that was going to do uh, do some research and write a paper. That was the main thing. But maybe you'd get together and think of an idea for a proposal or a data set, a new data set that would be useful for modelers or even a spinoff workshop. That was the job of, of everyone at Famous. 
And uh, Famous provided the ideas and connections, and the funding for that work had to come from somewhere else. So one example of uh, a cool Famous thing was introduced to us by John Marshall from MIT, something called climate response functions, which is where you impose a step change to the ice ocean state or forcing, and you look at the response time scale. So you're really, you're really hitting the system hard and you're seeing how it rings uh, to understand basic, um, uh, ba the basic physics of the system. And this was applied to the Beaufort High and the Beaufort Gyre, to ocean inflows and outflows at straits, and freshwater inputs like uh, like like river discharge or or even the Greenland uh, ice sheet melt. So here's a figure that Andre uh, liked to show, and it's just a time series of uh, several things. Uh, we ended up um, sort of equilibrating at 100 to 120 total participants per year, and about a third of those participants were early career, and we got tremendously positive feedback that those early career scientists really enjoyed interacting with each other, but also with the more senior uh, scientists. And here the, in red are the, the publications. Uh, so typically they would have a thanks to AOMIP or Famous in their acknowledgments. Uh, and there were many papers that came out of our workshops and many chapters of PhD theses um, that were inspired by um, discussions that happened during these me annual meetings. So here's like a you know giant long list that uh, ran through uh, 2016. And I'm, there's definitely more since then that probably Andre or I should collect one day. And at, with that, I'm going to end. And I think our next talks will tell you about CAMIS, which is the... Um, next generation of this kind of activity. Thank you very much. Great, that was a very nice overview um, of the past activities. I know that um, Andre is on the call, um, so maybe we can give him a, a big thank you for his visionary leadership on these uh, previous phases to um, improve the international collaboration on, on Arctic marine science. Um, so let's give them a, a virtual hands. Thank you. Um, Henry, yes. do you want to say something or are you okay? I'm just going to take a moment here, maybe while, while Andre is coming off mute, to note that um, we have or had in this meeting a like a ver an AI note taker that was transcribing the meeting. Um, I'm not sure, I don't see it anymore, but I just wanted to make people aware of that. Oh yeah, it's still there. I just wanted to thank everybody and thank Mike Steele for his great presentation and his actual conclusions about this. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Andre. Um, well, we'll hand it over to Jackie. All right, I'll share my screen. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, we can. I'm Jackie Flemmachinney at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And today I'll be giving you an introduction to the Consortium for the Advancement of Marine Arctic Science, or CAMAS. Um, the organizing committee for this program is shown below. It includes Wilbert Ware and Melina Veneziani at Los Alamos National Lab, myself and Vislav Marsalski at the Naval Post Graduate School, and Josh Zhang and Mike Steele at the University of Washington. So CAMAS is organized as part of the Hylat Rassam Project and sponsored by the Department of Energy's Regional and Global Model Analysis Program. With additional support from the Office of Naval Research and the Center for Nonlinear Studies at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Through CAMAS, we seek to facilitate and enhance national and international collaboration on marine Arctic science. This is motivated in part by the demonstrated need for and accomplishments of several of similar past efforts 
such as fam famous in AOMA, which Mike mentioned earlier. We also want to educate and inspire a new generation of Arctic scientists through the early career workshop and financial support provided to attend those planned workshops. The overall scientific goal is to advance the understanding and model representation of key marine Arctic processes that contribute to the rapid changes seen in the Arctic. The Arctic Earth system is changing fast. Successful adaptation requires accurate predictions and projections of these changes on interannual to decadal timescales made by reliable Earth system models. As models of the Arctic Earth system become increasingly complex, confronting them with available observations with each other and with theory has proven an efficient way of increasing our understanding of key processes that lead to rapid Arctic change, improving the representation of these processes and models and increasing our confidence in their projections. Along those lines, we have come up with three overarching themes for CAMAS. These include drivers and impacts of the heat and fresh water into and out of the Arctic, ocean ice atmosphere interactions in a warming Arctic, and biophysical impacts of Arctic marine biogeochemistry. We expect that multiple sub-projects will be developed under each of these themes and these will be decided on by the community. So the activities of CAMAS will include organizing annual workshops to bring together this community for efficient collaboration, coordinating model and in intercomparison studies designed by an international community of marine Arctic scientists, and disseminating findings through collaborative publications with perhaps a special volume establishing and maintaining a dedicated internet platform to facilitate ongoing um, collaboration. And um, I think I need to go back here. Sorry about that, I was on the wrong slide. So th these are the activities that we've got planned. Um, so the dedicated internet platform, you can see there with the link or the QR code. Um, and so we have, and additionally, we wanna contribute um, met to metrics packages um, to improve those. And other ideas for CAMAS are welcomed um, from the community. So we are planning to hold three annual meetings uh, for CAMAS to initiate, execute, and finalize these coordinated activities, such as multi-model analysis, model observational synthesis, development and evaluation of process-oriented metrics. Each workshop will be preceded by an early career school, and this one day school will include lectures and activities on hot topics in the field with ample discussion time and social time. In addition, some funding is available to support travel costs for these early career scientists. An early career here is defined as um, graduate students, um, and either undergraduate or graduate student, and also postdocs. This picture is showing um, a group of scientists who attended the famous meeting in 2016, and we hope to have a similar attendance at the first CAMAS meeting. So, an introduction to that meeting. Um, it's going to be uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, February 13th through the 16th, 2024. The Early Career School will be on February 13th and will be in-person only. While there will be remote participation for the workshop, we really strongly encourage in-person in, in attendance um, for the most productive discussions and interactions with fellow participants. We also encourage everyone to submit an abstract during the registration process. Most abstracts will be assigned a poster and a few will be selected for oral presentations. Early career scientists can submit a brief description of their interests if no abstract is available. We certainly don't want to discourage um, students who are early on in their thesis or dissertation projects. Remote participants can submit a presentation that will be made available in the online meeting agenda. And they'll also be given an opportunity for a three minute flash talk during the workshop. Now I'll just briefly describe the, the draft agenda items for the early career school. There will be four sessions of lectures from experts in these fields, including advances in marine 
modeling, advances in Arctic marine observations, advances in Arctic marine reanalysis, as well as Arctic model evaluation metrics. Time will also be devoted to breakout groups for discussion, as well as a demonstration with model evaluation metrics. And finally, the early career school participants will go for a group outing and dinner. And then the workshop will begin on February 14th, day one. We will hear from people working on topics related to the three overarching things, themes of CAMAS and have discussion time for each one. Again, these three themes are drivers and impacts of ocean heat and freshwater transport into and out of the Arctic, ocean ice atmosphere interact interactions in a warming Arctic, and biophysical impacts of Arctic marine biogeochemistry. We will also have breakout sessions in the afternoon, and finally a poster session with hors d'oeuvres in the early evening. On day two, February 15th, we'll have talks on Arctic marine modeling, observations, reanalysis, as well as metrics. And we'll also have flash talks from the remote participants, as well as breakout sessions again. And then on the last day of the workshop, February 16th, we will begin with keynote presentations, followed by breakout sessions. These breakout sessions are really important for the collaborations that we're trying to establish so that people can get going on um, projects to come out of CAMAS. And then we will have a reporting out from working groups plus next steps and conclusions. The meeting will end at noon on February 16th. And we have planned this meeting to occur just before the ocean sciences meeting that will be held in New Orleans. So this may benefit some people who want to um, come to the US, particularly our European or Asian colleagues um, who could link these two meetings together into one travel. Um, so we hope that that will be a helpful thing for people. Um, for more information and to register for the first workshop in early career school, please visit the link here. Um, show this link, we also have the QR code that you could scan. This will take you directly to the CAMAS webpage. Um, the deadline to apply to the Early Career School has been extended to November 30th. So please help us spread the word. If you would send this information to your departments, um, your students, that would be really helpful. Um, we want as many applicants as possible, especially for this Early Career School. The application is very simple, very short, um, and it's a great opportunity. The workshop registration deadline is January 1st, 2024. And if you have any questions or ideas, we'll hopefully have time to hear those very soon. Or if something comes up later, please uh, utilize the email addresses on the upper right hand of the slide for the workshop and the early career school. Um, we'd really love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your ideas if we don't have time today. And just thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing you in Santa Fe next year. Thanks so much. Oh, and if any of the other organizing committee members want to say something, please feel free to jump in. If I miss something, you're welcome. Did you mention the travel support for early career participants? Yes, travel yeah. support is is in the registration process. So, um, yeah, when you apply to on the website, you have the opportunity to say early career, and yes, you'd like travel support. So. Please do that. Great. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so great. So we'll now head into the discussion. Um, just to make sure that we need to be stopped at the top of the hour um, for on the agenda, we do have some uh, time set aside for community updates. And, and um, so if, if you have any um, updates to share with the community, uh, then maybe you can uh, send me a quick message in the chat so that I uh, so that we know how much time we have to set aside for that. Um, otherwise, I'll hand it over to Yashu. Um, hi, everyone. So um, here I have like a quick slide, uh, which can maybe help us to uh, to have a more effective discussion. So uh, for this part, uh, what we um, so here I repeat what uh, Jackie described before about the agenda so that first we have a one point one half hour 
uh, for each of the topic sessions. So, um, so when we, our committee members sit down and try to come up with the agenda, we had a lot of brainstorm discussion and say, what is the new trend? What have been done in the past few years? So, oh, someone said they cannot see the screen. Do, do you? And I don't know why um, we weren't able to before, but I can see it now. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, so um, so the, the thing is, in terms of topic, we find that recently in the past few years, we see a lot of connections happen. So for example, we see a lot of Arctic and subarctic interactions, like in terms of heat transport, in terms of freshwater transport. And we also see a lot of collection, uh, connections between the atmosphere and the ice and the ocean. So no one really stand like have a standalone perspective. Instead, people try to connect all these components. And finally, um, there is a lot of connection between the physics to the to the uh, by, to the BGC and then to the uh, ecosystem. For example, the stratification may affect the nutrient supply, which further affect the uh, primary production. So these are that's why we put these three topics, which is also which are also the uh, focus topics for the highlight project. And then we define uh, four uh, frontiers, which we see a lot of new things happening in the past few years. So that's why we've put one hour on each of the frontier. Uh, for example, one is the uh, marine modeling. So we, for example, we see uh, unstructured mesh um, instead of the instead of the regular uh, grid in the model design. And for observations, we see a lot of like uh, uh, M and uh, vehicles, for example, doing a lot of observations and a lot of new technologies, uh, new satellite observations happening. And for the reanalysis, there are a lot of like new ways to do the reanalysis, like machine learning based or other new methods. And for the metrics, there's new packages developed for like very efficient large data um, uh, intermodal comparison. So these are the four frontiers we find. So that's why we gave one hour on each of the uh, new frontier. And then the most important part, which as uh, 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 Mike mentioned before, which is a tradition from uh, AOMIP and uh, FAMOUS is that we want people to sit down together to come up with ideas for projects, for papers, for collaborations. So that's why we hope that on day one, this one, one, one and a half hour, people can come up and sit down to form ideas, to form small groups, to form these collaborations. And on the day two, another one, one hour and a half, people can start to develop along these ideas. And then on day three, there is like a finalize finalize these ideas and uh, and and report back to the to the entire group. So um, the we we have the three work groups in a row in three years, so that we hope by the end of this three year phase we will have see a lot of out outcomes uh, from these uh, breakout sessions. So um, for today's discussion, uh, there are a few questions our uh, organizing committee are specifically interested to learn what people, what the community think about along this line. So what's the best way, effective way to structure these breakout sessions, um, especially on day one when people don't know each other very well, like how can we engage everyone into these uh, discussions? And how should we um, break out these sessions? Like what could be good compelling topics that people can have very uh, active participation um, and how to engage all the other career scientists who are usually very shy, who usually don't want to see a lot in front of, um, you know, like more established scientists, how to get them involved into these discussion sessions. And finally, beyond the four established frontiers we listed here, is there any other critical areas that we have been overlooking, um, but we should include in these discussions. I think that's the questions we have, and I want to open the floor and see if people have comments on any of this.
Yeah, Mike, please. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if this is intended to be part of modeling, but I don't don't see any place for uh, theoretical approaches. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, well, I think theoretical mm, it's a it's a huge area and. I usually, well, that's just me maybe. I usually see it as a part of the modeling work because usually theoretical and simplified models or conceptual models are always together. So I'm not sure if other people have other input on this, but that's a good point. I personally see it the same way, Joshua. Or if you have some questions or, or some concerns or something, you can also um, uh, bring it up here. Yeah, Renew. So um, uh, though DOE is sponsoring it, I'm, I'm really, this is the first time I'm seeing all these details in a presentation. And so uh, personally, I, 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 I like uh, the idea very much. And I also wanted to, acknowledge IRPIC for, um, I, I remember I've been a part of IRPIC for a while now, uh, for about uh, seven years or so. And um, during the time is when, um, you know, uh, some of us became more familiar with AOMEP and everything through uh, Andre's work and uh, so uh, it's really nice to see that uh, we can take it forward and go forward um and uh through IRPIC also I, I mean Wilbert and others have uh, led a, a topic on modeling biases in the Arctic so I was wondering whether that's going to uh play a part in this uh particular upcoming CAMAS uh activity uh, are you uh planning on inviting the different modeling teams and um in addition to that like what mike uh, Paul just mentioned um are you do you think theoretical methods would uh help in identifying biases uh or not do you think how do you plan to bring all of them together can you talk a little bit more about it yeah that's a really good question well I'll try to answer, but I'll also ask other uh, committee members to help here. So I think um, we didn't specifically say we have to cover all the modeling teams and all the modeling groups, but we hope that many people from different model groups will come here and bring their own perspectives. So not only the US models, but also the other Asian and, and European model modelers can come here and brainstorm together. So I think this is more um, uh, open to the entire like modeling community, including all the uh, people who do observations and reanalysis and others, that we are pulling a lot of things into one pool. And when you do this, actually, it's very hard to predict what will come out of it. So we want to make it like loosely defined, less like to, to bring more freedom into this whole thing. And just as you mentioned, all the theoretical things, it's definitely very helpful and it will be part of the mix. Yeah, that's what we hope, I guess. Is there any, anything else that other uh, community members want to bring here? Um, sure, can I chip in for, for a little bit? Um, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, Renu. Um, indeed, a couple of months ago, we had a, an IARPIC session on uh, where we just brought together people from the um, climate modeling community to, to discuss the biases in the representation of the Arctic Ocean stratification. Um, that would be an excellent topic to to include in uh, CAMAS. Um, so I guess we, what we what we have to do, and, and hopefully this uh, discussion session will will provide some ideas um, on, on sort of the one extreme is that we just see who shows up and based on who shows up and who brings ideas to the table, 
uh, we, we define the, the research projects, but we can also um, define some of these, uh, these topics beforehand and really explicitly invite the, the relevant people that might be interested in participating in that to the, to the command session. So hopefully um, in the next couple of weeks, next uh, couple of months, we will actually be able to define a couple of these projects that, uh, that we as a community would be interested in pursuing, and then we can reach out um, explicitly to people who we want to engage, who should be engaged in, this, um, in these activities. And yeah, looking at the ocean vices in ocean stratification is a, is a really good topic uh, for, for CAMAS, I believe, that would definitely combine uh, modelers, um, observationalists, um, that, that bring them together to, to make progress on that. Um, did you want to question, uh, direct a question about the, the theoretical modeling uh, to Mike specifically, or Renu? Uh, I'd leave it open, no <laughs> pressure, but um, would love to hear uh, Mike's perspective too. Yeah, Mike. So if you if you can um, can comment on that, have, and, and maybe your experience, um, how your theoretical approaches kind of contributed to uh, previous farmers activities, for instance. Um, sure. I'm not exactly sure what you want me to comment on. I mean, I, I think theory and idealized models are on the fringes of what has typically been presented as modeling in AOMIP and and famous. I think overwhelmingly the modeling is more comprehensive models. Um, so I, I don't really, I think it may be getting uh, short changed if it's just sort of tucked in with modeling. Um, I know there's probably more effort being put towards comprehensive models than there are toward theoretical models, uh, but it's you know traditionally the third leg of the scientific stool and um, you know, I'd like to see it represented in this community as well. Yeah, definitely. Maybe one way to yeah, make it more clear is that we can, uh, uh, in the agenda, we can um, specifically mention that theoretical uh, modeling or simplified modeling are also part of the part of the uh, uh, part of the work, part of the agenda. Is there anything else that people want to uh, bring up? I guess I would encourage people to, because I think organizing the breakout session in a very ineffective, in effect, in an effective way uh can be tricky right because uh there are all this uh interconnected topics so people are interested in in many of them so how how we organize that i i, I feel like it, it can be tricky so if people you know has had you know um previous and successful um experience uh with you know with with previous farmers meetings uh and have um suggestions uh, do let us know. Yeah, Lauren. Now we're here. Hi, um, I'm on the IR Big Data Management team, so I guess I'm going to throw out the option that I found that data management is also a really important thing for modelers and observationalists to be able to talk to each other, having common data formats, understanding where data is like having those common data sets that you can refer to. So having data management is some sort of connector that that's a foundational activity for a lot of this can be a really useful tool. So I'm going to throw that out there. Yes, that is definitely an important thing. And many of like they have uh, appeared many times in our uh, uh, when we were doing the brainstorming and and people were many modelers are complaining saying hey I cannot find the right data that to use and and it's the uh, same uh, the other way around so Wilbert do you want to add anything uh, maybe we slow was earlier before me I'm not quite sure 
Which one do you wanna? Sure, yeah, I have a, a very short one. Uh, I was just uh, thinking about, you know, 20 minutes or 15 minutes uh, during this uh, meeting right now, it's maybe not enough. So I would encourage people who have some ideas or will discuss this uh, meeting with uh, their colleagues and, and uh, younger uh, advisees, uh, if they have any new ideas that they want to bring to the meeting, uh, post a presentation uh, for the first meeting will be probably a good opportunity. And uh, if you have enough uh, people interested in your idea, uh, the first meeting will actually provide that uh, options to maybe gather and uh, create a group or a subgroup to pursue your particular idea and topics. Thank you. That's right. And the poster session is on the first evening. So that's good to get those conversations going early. Yeah. Robert. Yeah, I do want to highlight uh, one more thing that we have been discussing with our organizing committee, and that is that um, one of the deliverables that we want to propose is not just uh, papers and, and maybe even a special issue of, of, a, of a, a journal or so, um, but also um, the metrics part. Um, so our the highlight resin team is, is collaborating with uh, PCMDI uh, folks at Lawrence Livermore National Lab to actually um, expand their uh, PCMDI metrics package um, with Arctic marine uh, metrics. And we think that would be a, a really nice um, receptacle of um, metrics that can be developed in the, in the context of um, CAMAS uh, projects, basically. Uh, Junior Lee is, is, is also on the call. He is um, he's leading that activity in collaboration with uh, Ji Wu Lee and, and, and Paul Dirac at, um, at Lawrence Livermore. Um, but this is something that we definitely want to, uh, to highlight. Uh, so as part of the, the, the scientific explorations, um, we hope to uh, inspire or, or encourage the, the, the collaborative teams to develop metrics that then can be contributed to these um, model evaluation packages, basically. Thank you, Wilbur, for the comment. Yeah, I think I think we are uh, uh, 52 right now. So I do want to leave a few minutes for the community to uh, update if there are anything. So I'll hand it over back to Wilbert. And as uh, Wislaw and, and Jackie mentioned before, there there's definitely not enough time to get all people's input. So please uh, do uh, email to us, um, which can be found on our website and then um, uh, please do let us know. So, thank you. Great, thank you, Yashu, for leading that discussion. Um, are, there any, um, are, there, are there any community updates uh, for this physical oceanography uh, community of practice? Does anybody have any new projects to share or things that we uh, should be aware of? Maybe some workshops or so that are coming up? Maybe just to prime the pump, one thing that I can, can mention is that, um, yeah, maybe some of you remember that in June we had this um, session on, on biases in Arctic Ocean stratification. Um, that is a series of, of uh, webinars that we are actually continuing now um, as part of the modelers uh, community of practice. And our next session is going to be next Tuesday, uh, November 7th, um, where we will be focusing on biases in Arctic clouds in, um, in Earth system models. So not specifically uh, for, the, for the ocean, um, but it might be an, a relevant session for, for many of you on the call. Are there any other such uh, updates, people that um, want to share any upcoming meetings or events that we should be aware of? All right, I don't see any else in the chat or uh, no hands up. So with that, I'll, I guess we'll conclude it. I'll hand it back over to, uh, to Meredith to close the session. Thanks everyone. Um, this meeting will be posted, um, the recording will be posted by the end of the day today, most likely, or Thursday next week. Our website's experiencing some glitches, so you might not be able to access it um, super easily, but that should be fixed. 
and um, pretty soon. And I have a meeting that's um, directly adjacent to this one. So I'm not going to be able to shut this meeting down. So I'll just ask everyone to um, leave of your own accord. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining and we hope to uh, see many of you at the first CAMAS workshop in February next year. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.